The Bain Free Radio Hour. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David F. Shirod. No one does sword and sorcery quite like Howard Andrew Jones. And this week, we bring you part one of a two-part interview with the man himself. Our own Sean C.W. Korsgaard caught up with Jones at Gen Con, and the two discussed Jones's Bane Books debut novel, Lord of a Shattered Land, which is part one in his Chronicles of Hanuvar series. Let's take a look and listen. Ladies, gentlemen, and readers of all ages, welcome back to the Bane Free Radio Hour. I am your host, Sean C.W. Korsgaard, live at Gen Con with our very own Howard Andrew Jones, fresh off his Bane debut of Lord of a Shattered Land. How are you feeling, Howard? I'm pretty good. Of course, it's Gen Con, so I'm a little road zoned already. As it is, as it is. What have been some of your convention highlights so far? Oh my goodness. Aside from the debut, of course. Sure. Well, you know, it's always great to see all the fans again and to see everyone so excited to be here at Gen Con and to come look at all the treasures in the Great Hall. Uh, probably reconnecting with uh, Seth Lindbergh, uh, who I used to work with at Magician Skull, the magazine I edit. And... Um, Matt John, uh, one of the rogues in the house, and of course meeting the invisible Sean Korsgaard who's asking these questions behind the camera. Uh, and then uh, last night we hooked up with Jim Zub, uh, the Conan writer, and that was pretty cool. And the whole crew there at uh, Heroic Signatures. Uh, uh, Eric Mona of Paizo, we went out for a steak dinner with him uh, the night before and oh my god. That was, uh, I don't eat steak that fine very often. As a matter of fact, I don't eat steak very often. I'm more of a, a white meat, fish, vegetarian kind of guy, to be perfectly honest. But uh, that was uh, that was something. And the picture I got of Sean eating their world-famous uh, shrimp cocktail. What was the name? St. Elmo's. St. Elmo's Steakhouse. He looked like he was in an ad for a shampoo commercial. I swear his hair blew back after he tried that world-famous shrimp cocktail. Hey now, Howard, that's all classified, man. <laughs> I'm going to share that picture I took. And I also hear that later on you'll be testing out the new Conan board game with some illustrious company. That's right, that's right. Uh, Matt John is uh, sort of doing a road test of the... Uh, I'm not even sure it's the beta version yet. I think it's like the alpha version of the new game. And uh, so far he's got me and Sean involved and... Uh, Scott Lynch said he might pop by, and Jim Zub might pop by, so it'd be pretty cool to have us all sitting down to play the new Conan role-playing game together. I, I'm not allowed to tell anything about the mechanics, but I do know it's full of Sumerians. Now, we aren't here to talk about Conan, though. We're here to talk about Hanuvar. So, Howard, let's see the cover and hear your world-famous elevator pitch. Well, here it is. You want the elevator pitch or the, uh, the longer one? Let's do longer. Let's do longer. Okay. Well, you see it's got... Well, maybe you can't tell from this particular picture, but it has a real Mediterranean, uh, ancient Mediterranean sword and sandal vibe to it, for starters. So, you know, picture Romans and gladiators and Spartacus and all that stuff. When the Durban Empire came for the city of Volanus, its people fought block by block house by house, until most of them fell with sword in hand. Only a few thousand survived to be led away in chains. The destruction was nearly complete. They looted the treasuries, they set fire to the temples, they sowed the ground with salt. They overlooked only one detail. The greatest Fulani general had escaped alive. And now alone, against the might of a vast empire, Hanavar has only an aging sword arm a lifetime of wisdom, and the greatest military mind in the world bent upon a single goal. No matter where his people have been taken, from the furthest outpost of the empire to its rotten heart, he will find them. Every last one of them, and he will set them free. And for those of you at home wondering what that tingly feeling is, don't worry, you just got chills. <laughs> and. 
The book itself is utterly magnificent. I remember when I passed it on to Tony that the excitement in my evaluation and her reading, you know, I remember her first email back where she said, I'm 50 pages in and is it all this good? And of course, getting to hear her gush about it this year at Fantasy and Liberty Con had to have been quite a thrill. Yeah, it's, uh, it's humbling is what it is. You hope that people will like your work, and when someone really likes your work and is going to support it as much as Bane's already been supporting me, it's, uh, it's life-changing, to be perfectly honest. Now, before we dig back into some of the reception we've been seeing for it, let's talk a bit more about the plot. Now, Hanovar is based on Hannibal of Carthage, and this is sort of your take if Hannibal, after the fall of Carthage, had managed to live on, fight another day, and discover a new cause to live and die for. That's right. Um, well, what we don't get in our overviews of ancient history when we're in high school or college is the sense that Hannibal sort of lumped in with all the other conquerors because, of course, he, he came across the mountains uh, to invade Italy. But unlike so many of the great generals of history, he wasn't really trying to make Italy a Carthaginian colony or anything like that. He knew that if he didn't stop the Romans, they would come for his people's holdings. And 50 years after his death, they did. Uh, and they did much as uh, I have the Durban Empire do in, in my book, right? They uh, famously sowed the ground with salt and sold the entire population into slavery after they killed so many tens of thousands of people. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's the inspiration. I always found Hannibal very fascinating, brilliant, probably, uh, well, he's definitely among the greatest generals of ancient history and probably among the greatest generals of all time. And uh, I think he's head and shoulders above, um, above them in other ways. Just a brilliant fellow. So uh, I've been fascinated with him since I was about 16 and I thought he would make a great lead character, but I didn't want to write uh, alternate history. Uh, I wanted to have uh, monsters and mayhem and actual sorcery that worked. And I also didn't want to be uh, constrained by other true events. I wanted to make up things and uh, have new characters and uh, more surprises. So while there's big similarities, especially in his character with how I see the original Hannibal, uh, much of the rest of it is uh, uh, tweaked and changed around and um, since it's the secondary world. Now, one of the, I guess that's fascinating to me, is that Hanovar has been much like Conan was for Howard in your head for ages. What, when did you first start to get the idea and when did you really start putting his story to paper? His chronicles, rather. Well, well, yeah, what I didn't realize is that in my interest in Hannibal and uh, the era of the Roman Republic and other great generals like uh, Scipio, his uh, great antagonist, who, you know, they were actually, uh, they actually respected each other. Anyway, all of these figures. What I didn't realize while reading about them for decades was that I was actually doing research for this thing that I would eventually write uh, about 12 or 15 years ago is when I came up with Hanover and I actually submitted it to John O'Neill at Black Gate when it was still a print magazine. And uh, uh, he really liked it, and he really wanted to print it, but the magazine was closing down. And I actually told him, well, look, this is kind of like a trial balloon. I'm not even, um, I don't feel like it's quite right yet. And I kept honing that first story for years because I didn't feel like it was quite right yet. And um, finally, uh, when magicians Skull was just a vague idea in the back of Joseph Goodman's head. Uh, he asked me if I had any sword and sorcery stories that he could publish in a Gen Con supplement. And I said, well, as it happens, I've been working on one. And I, I gave it to him. And, uh, and he really liked it. And that, that was sort of the start of it. Um, and I kept thinking about the character and, and how much I loved writing him. And I wrote a few more as, as, he, um, as Joseph continued to ask for stories for Magician's Skull. Um, but it wasn't too long. I think it was after I wrote the second one I began to realize, you know, I was writing them in order anyway. 
I really want to write more of these, and I would like to write them in a very close episodic format so that one feeds into the next and they're all locked in together. And um, I was still writing the St. Martin series, the Ringsworn trilogy at the time. But in my evenings, I would begin to write down thumbnails for other ideas that could happen to Hanover. I thought, oh, you know, I could probably get a, a good solid book out of this. But before too long, I had so many ideas like, you know, I think I could probably get two books out of this. And no, the ideas just kept coming. I was like, okay, three. No, the ideas just kept coming. And, and pretty soon I saw how I could do at least five, maybe more. So uh, I could hardly wait. Uh, once I got the Ringsworn uh, trilogy finished, I just sat down and I began writing down more Hanavar stories. I uh, structured them and, and... So the idea is then that each book would be like a TV season so that there's a number of episodes and they all interlock. Um, but some information is introduced here as a secret and then we... Uh, later on in the cycle we figure out what's really going on or this character is introduced here and returns here there's overarching arcs that begin in one story and end in another the idea was that each episode could stand alone so that if you tuned in it would make complete sense but that they're much richer if you read them in order and then uh, I close out the book with sort of a season climax a, f a season finale so that a whole lot of threads are resolved and you know maybe a big bad is defeated um, but there's enough left over for the next season. I don't want to suggest that there's a cliffhanger. I, I, I don't have anything wrong with cliffhangers. One of my favorite series has a beautiful cliffhanger. Uh, Chronicles of Amber, fourth book, ends with the most amazing cliffhanger ever. But I don't really want to do cliffhangers in this series. I want each book to feel like, oh, oh that was satisfying, right? You know, I, I got to the end. Well, that was a great season climax. Um, uh, I'm ready for the next one. Now, that's one of the funniest things about hearing you talk about how it grew from one book to two to three, is that you turned in the first book, and no sooner, I think, than the contract had signed, you turned in the second, and probably by the time people are reading this, we'll be looking at book three, which we're not going to talk about until we talk about book two in October, people. So... Well, I, but, could, I, I, I couldn't stop writing it, right? So I sent out uh, book one. My agent and I sent it to a number of places, although I'll be honest, uh, even though I sent it to a number of places, I, I had fingers crossed for Bane because I figured they really got heroes. And this is about a hero. This is about a selfless guy doing his all for his people, right? I figured, and, and sure enough, it did resonate with them. But anyway, that process, it takes a long time for publishers to evaluate books because, believe it or not, there's lots of people sending them books. So it took six or seven months, and in that time, I just kept writing Hanavar. So I had a second book. Um, I think maybe it was in polish. It wasn't quite in rough drafting for it, but it wasn't quite ready. So I sent them like the. Uh, I spent another month or so polishing it, and then I sent them book two. And uh, there it was. And I think the most exciting thing was that I sent the proposal for one book, outlines for two, and I just sort of vaguely mentioned I've got ideas for at least two more. And so the offer, when the offer came back for five, I knew that they must have loved that first one. Any, anyway, I'm, I'm blathering because I'm so excited. Go on. I mean, we're excited too, Howard. You've written one hell of a book. We wouldn't have, we, we wouldn't be as proud to put the Bane logo on the side if we weren't. But another thing that's such an outstanding feature of the Chronicles of Hanovar is, of course, Hanovar himself. He is such a breath of fresh air in terms of heroics. A great entry in that sword and sorcery tradition of a memorable character while deviating from the norms in some way. He is an older character. He uses his wits as much as his sword arm. And you've just created such a marvelous character. Well, um, that's great. I, I thought, I mean, I, I've told you I've based him a lot about how I feel Hanavar would act if he were, excuse me, Hannibal would act if he were, uh, uh, if he were left after the fall of his city, what would he do? Well, we don't really know, but I get to speculate. You know, he's supposed to be this great warrior and he's the smartest man in every room, um, but I thought it'd be more interesting if I did it when he was um, in middle age. So he may not be as uh, spry, he may, his endurance may not be as strong. Don't get me wrong, he still, he's, he still kicks butt. But he knows he's got his limits. You know, he's got a couple of old injuries that slow him down a little bit, and uh, 
he's also vastly outnumbered. So he constantly has to use that incredible intellect of his to get through problems. He can't just bash his way through. It's always fun to see all the various people we've spoken to try to describe Hanovar. We've heard he's Denzel Washington's The Equalizer in High Fantasy. We've heard he's Carthaginian John Wick. I believe your chosen description is he's Aragorn if Sauron had won the War of the Ring. Yeah, he's sort of behind enemy lines against this impossible force trying to do good. And the other nice thing is you have given him a lot of great characters, not just to bounce off of, but recurring characters. You have Antares, who is the chronicler of the Chronicles of Hanovar. One of the great little joys throughout the novel is you have Antares and his descendants bantering back and forth about details of the story in the footnotes. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't want to have uh, footnotes that were distracting, but I thought it would be kind of fun. You know, there's, uh, and, and Tyrius is the chronicler, and so he, uh, he has sort of, he concludes each of the short stories. The short stories are in third person, but he has notes that are supposedly excerpted from his great work uh, collecting Hanavar's stories. And then I also have one of his uh, descendants commenting upon that, and uh, his, uh, there's also a great scholar who I use to um, explain uh, various bits of terminology. Uh, but you can completely ignore those. They're not really necessary. They're just sort of like a, uh, if you're grooving on footnotes and want to have more detail, there it is. Meanwhile, you also go the extra mile to show that although the Durvins conquered his people, there are good Durvins and Hanovar bears the civilization as a whole, no great ill will. I think Cyprian might be one of the best I'm not even sure what to call him, because he's not an antagonist or even a rival at this point. He's your Scipio stand-in, I suppose. Right, right. Well, you know, in, in real history, they seem to, they seem to like each other, uh, even though they were leaders on opposite sides, and it was Scipio who defeated Han uh, Hannibal. So, um, yeah, I, 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 their relationship is very fascinating to me, and always has been. And so uh, I thought, what a, what a great touchstone. I'm going to do something with that relationship, what it would be like. And then there's the variety of the ups and downs and twists and turns that even just in Lord of a Shattered Land you take with the narrative. You have everything from a rather heartwarming story of Hanavar saving an elephant while traveling with a circus to my own personal favorite and the one I tell people to read is The Warrior's Way, the second chapter in the novel, which you read at Liberty Con to a room that you brought to tears. Well, you know, there's that uh, <laughs> there's that bit from Forrest Gump, and I guess Forrest Gump doesn't get mentioned too much with sword and sorcery, but you know that whole box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get? So there's 14 stories in here. I did not want them to feel like the same story retreaded 14 times. I want every one of them to be different. So some of them are... Um, some of them are straight-up adventure stories. Some of them are really rather horrific. Some of them are more light-hearted. Uh, some of them have a bit of a thriller feel to them. Some of them have a bit of a mystery feel to them. When you start one, you're not sure what it's going to be like, but you can be guaranteed that Hanover is going to be kicking butt at some point in the story. He's going he's gonna to get through, somehow. I did particularly like the heist episode where, and of course... Oh, that's from book two, though, it, isn't it? Uh-huh, fair enough. But there was the... I guess just after hearing you and Steve Diamond talk about Columbo and hard-boiled detective thrillers all last year, getting to see you take a stab at it in a sword and sorcery <laughs> setting, in this book and the next, has been... You do some... You push the boundaries of what sword and sorcery and fantasy are capable of in a lot of ways. Well, you know, I think... I think you can't keep a genre in a straitjacket. I, I, there's some people think that sword and sorcery means only a dude in a loincloth and sandals, a big muscular dude in loincloth and sandals, whacking on monsters. And actually, I like some of those stories quite a lot. But I don't think that that's the only way to do sword and sorcery. I think that there's a whole lot more you can do with the genre than that. Now, of course, you do have Hanavar whacking on some monsters at several points, and yeah. your monsters are both the human and otherwise. 
Yeah, and I think he's, he, he even swims in a loincloth before he engages with one monster. So, I mean, I do know the tropes. But you really do have a knack for... Well, as the genre spawned by weird tales, you get the strange and surreal aspect to your horror as well. Yeah, it has to be eerie and disquieting. I, I don't like... Um, well, that's not fair. Actually, I do like, in other kinds of fantasy, uh, different simple kinds of fantasy and things, but when I'm reading my sword and sorcery, I don't want it to be uh, something that can be controlled very easily. I don't want it to be simple. I don't want it to be trustworthy. I want it to be dark and dangerous and deadly. And if you get too involved in magic, it's probably going to twist you around and mess you up. Now, one of the other things that's, I guess, a standout to the book, for me at least, is that he is an older character. This is not young Conan in his prime. This is an older gentleman forced to, by age and circumstance, be even more of an outsider than most sword and sorcery protagonists, to be out of his depth at every step. What was sort of your thought process behind making, I guess, our first middle-aged, looking at retirement, sword and sorcery protag? Well, he's not really first. We have Drust the Axe, right? Fair enough. Fair enough, yeah. And we have King Conan. Now, uh, King Conan, I think, is uh, not quite looking at retirement, so King Conan even is younger than, um, than Hanavar. But Hanavar's in his late 40s, early 50s, and you'd think, looking at me, if, well, of course he'd be writing that, but as I just described to you a few minutes ago, I actually conceptually came up with him when I was younger than this, but uh, uh, I, I don't know. You know, someone asked me, well, why did you want to do it as short stories? It just felt like the right thing to do. It felt like that was the way to do it. it so someone, who's, someone who has the wisdom and who's struggled so much and achieved so much already, and then to have it taken away, what, what does that do to him? What can he do? What would be different? I guess, you know, to be perfectly honest, uh, I guess I'm a little bit tired of writing about young people beginning their journey and the hero's journey and all that. Uh, I, I want to read about someone who's already... He, he knows what he's capable of doing. He doesn't need to learn new skills. He's got his skills. Uh, he doesn't need to find himself and, and his destiny and, and come into his power. No, he's got other crap to worry about, thank you very much. He's got to go save his people, right? I was more interested in exploring that. And while we should have some shorts throughout our YouTube channel for the next few weeks, where you talk about this a bit more, one thing I did love is that you've been very open that you read up a lot about Medal of Honor winners, like Audie Murphy, while trying to give some pathos and heroics to your characters. Well, yeah, so I didn't do that because I was trying to research this character, but it certainly uh, influenced this character, right? I mean, I became fascinated with reading about the Medal of Honor uh, winners when I came across a display um, at, a, uh, at a memorial, and it uh, gave, their, gave some of their stories, and wow, I, I've spoken with you about this um, in the past. You're one of the few people I've seen moved to tears talking about Audie Murphy. David, you're doing it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it means a lot that those stories move you that way. Well, yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, is it <laughs> I'm going to look like I cry easily. I only cry when I'm talking about heroes, I guess. The, these people who will risk everything, even if they know, even if they know they might go down, right? Uh, because they know the job needs to get done. They know that if they don't, someone's going to die. They're trying to help. And so, uh, look, I say that I've modeled this guy off of Hannibal, but we don't actually know that much about Hannibal's personality. We've seen his actions. But the Romans did a really great job of destroying Carthage, all their literature. So I have to think, what is this guy like? And so I'd already done all this reading on Medal of Honor recipients, but that's the kind of mindset, right? So I went back and I read even more and reacquainted myself with it to kind of get the feel of what kind of 
character is this person going to have? We can see it, what few records remain of Hannibal, but I needed a better insight into his psychology and how he deals with his every day. And certainly Audie Murphy is one of the, uh, one of the touchstones off of this. Yeah. And you really do bring that nobility and spirit of heroism to every page, which, not to disparage the wonderful grimdark fantasy or some of the takes we've seen from that, it's nice to have a hero in fantasy who's a general, generally good person, who has a great heart and love of his people and his friends. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love grimdark characters. Uh... Far from the Grey Mouse are, are barely heroes at all, and, and they've been some of my favorites for oh. ages. And Conan, Conan's a bit of a rogue. I mean, he's done some terrible things. He will stand up for the people he's he's uh, pledged to protect. Um, some people don't seem to get that, but he's he's not uh, he's not a paladin, right? So, uh, yeah, there's been characters I've enjoyed all along. Uh, Corwin of Amber is uh, pretty gray too, right? But um, Anyway, yeah, I don't have anything against those, but I wanted to write a story about a guy who is uh, pretty much straight up here. And I will say it's been a thrill watching this whole being fairly new to Bay, and this was my first series. I had a chance to pass up to the boss and see it get brought from pitch to the book you now hold in front of you. I'll hold it in front of me. That's... Good timing, Howard. But, <laughs> and that whole process, seeing the excitement and joy that book has brought to the staff that's worked on it, the authors who you've shared it with. I mean, it's been... You've gotten to hear everybody from Larry Correa to Steve Diamond to some of our guys like Casey Ozell and Justin Watson gush about this book. And what's it been like especially as a new author to Bane, seeing all of your fellow Bane authors embrace you and uplift Hanavar. Well, it's been... It's been heartwarming. I feel... Well, first, I feel like, okay, yeah, I'm definitely at the right place. These people get it. They get me. Um, what can I say? It's been wonderful. It's like coming home. And, uh, yeah... It's a wonderful, warm reception, and I hope that the readers enjoy it as much as uh, as staff and my, my fellow writers have. And of course, you are one of a nice group of new to Bane authors with their first books dropping this year and early next. We didn't... Your first Bane Free Radio Hour interview was with three of them, Gregory Frost, Marissa Wolf, and Mona Lisa Foster. Of course, given how many people I'm sure we have watching and listening who are curious about the process of becoming a Bane author, what's it been like for you as somebody who came from another publisher who has experience working in the magazines for years, who's cut their teeth in the genre? What is it about Bane that stands out and what's it like being part of the Bane family? Well, the amount of support I received uh, from the get-go even, you know, so I hadn't quite signed yet, and already things were moving along in, in, in such such a pleasing way. I felt so supported by um, fellow Bane writers. I guess, so behind the scenes, there's an incredible amount of support from the office staff who will put you in contact with people to help spread the word about what you're doing. Um, they will help smooth things out if you're going to conventions. Um, they will reach out to the press. And then, I don't want to suggest that there's no camaraderie amongst your fellow writers if you're at uh, other publishers, but it's more on an individual basis. Like, oh yes, I'm friendly with this person at this imprint, I'm friendly with this person at this imprint because we're friends. When you're at Bain, it feels like all the other authors at Bain are ready and willing to help you, which is... You're not on your own. And let's face it, you are on your own. It's your book. But you feel at least that these other people are rooting you on, and they will open doors, and, and they will help spread the word. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. And the other fun thing has been watching the reviews begin to drop. 
the fans begin to get copies, the blurbs from authors and other... F I mean, before we share a few of those, because, brother, you have gotten some great blurbs. What's it been like watching people as they finally get to see this book you poured so much love and effort and passion into, and seeing them light up the way they have been? It's a little unreal, right? I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, am I imagining this? Is, <laughs> is it all going to go south? Is that going to be the last one, and then everyone's just going to turn away? You know, we're talking here just a few days after the release so I don't I don't know what's gonna happen what's gonna happen next man fingers crossed maybe it's just these people who like it and everyone else will think bah. but hopefully it'll keep going because it certainly is inspiring to see that I've reached these people I, I hope that I'll reach more I hope that they find in this character the things I think I put in and that they'll find it inspirational that's what I want to see I want people I want to have done something good I want to have left something that other people can take hope from. Now, I just want to actually see your reactions to some of the things people have been saying about your book, including <laughs> the one that certainly caught my eye at first. This wonderful work put me in the mind of the stories I read when I was editing Bain's Robert E. Howard Library. That comes from Mr. David Drake the best-selling author of our Hammers, Slammers, Redliners, and Bettyus and Friends. Yeah, that was, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> I mean, David Drake is a man of few words, and yet he certainly cuts the quick with that one. He's been very kind to me for years. I, um, I edited a line of books reprinting Harold Lamb's swashbuckling fiction. Harold Lamb was a huge influence on Robert E. Howard, and so I reached out to uh, David Drake to see if he'd write an introduction for one of them, and, and he did. And he's been kind to me uh, ever since. He's a kind man. Uh, and so I reached out to him to see if he'd be interested in, uh, in reading Hanavar. And he was, and he had nice things to say. And another fellow who compared you to Robert E. Howard is, of course, Mr. Larry Correa, who it's been rather fun to see post signing to see him cheerleading you and saying he'd wished you'd been a Bane author for years and now that's come true and especially on that interview with him, you and Steve on Writer Dojo from a couple weeks ago. Seeing Larry gush about books is always fun but he again he compares you to Robert Howard one of the and says you're one of the finest voices in Sword and Sorcery today. I mean that's got to be a hell of a good feeling. It is. It is. Uh, you know, it's interesting that we're at Gen Con. That's the first time I met Larry. And I, I'm trying to remember how many years ago it was. It's probably been about five years because it was pre-COVID. Um, we were on a panel and we were just uh, geeking out over Robert E. Howard and Conan and other Robert E. Howard stuff together. And we're like, hey, you want to grab a meal? So me and him and Steve Diamond and, um, gosh, another black belt. I've forgotten her name. I feel terrible. Um, anyway, we went and we had this awesome meal. And uh, whenever we get together, as you can tell if you've listened to Writer Dojo, we just, um, me and Larry and Steve just go on and on and on about great adventure fiction and old pulps and Robert E. Howard and uh, detective novels and uh, have a great time. Anyway, he has, uh, Larry's been just so welcoming to me, so warm, so supportive. Uh, it's just been great to see. Um, yeah, I'm delighted. The spiritual successor to Robert E. Howard, he called you. And then you have John O'Neill, who's been a great friend to you, to Bain, to so many writers. Back, so many writers. Yeah, and he's... Howard Andrew Jones is the leading sword and sorcery author of the 21st century. Hanavar is a magnificent achievement, destined to become a modern classic. Yeah. James Ng, the World Fantasy Award nominated author. Yeah, the creator of Morlock. Ah. Oh. Yeah. This book is a riveting portrait of a hero trying to keep his civilization alive in the face of a military defeat. It's another triumph for Howard Andrew Jones, premier wielder of the new edge in sword and sorcery. Yeah, that meant a lot to me. I've known, uh, I've known uh, John and James for a very long time. You know, when John pulled James Ng out of the slush, it was so good he thought someone was... Uh, 
someone was uh, trying to pass off some old Jack Vance story as uh, as their own and trying to plagiarize it because it was so good. It's like this must be some Vance story I have read. No, that was James Ng, uh, and James Ng is probably the most celebrated of uh, uh, the sword and sorcery writers uh, from Black Gate. The most celebrated writer from Black Gate. Period. Uh, yeah, and we did get to. We'll be spending some more time with him throughout Gen Con, but Mr. Jim Zub, fresh off of the 100,000 copy selling new Conan comic book. <laughs> yeah. No slouch when it comes to sword and sorcery, it seems. Yeah, yeah. Howard knows his way around swords, sorcery, and stunning set pieces. He wields his words with the precision that comes from a veteran who knows the genre well and is eager to plumb its depths to uncover something new and exciting. Yeah, that was nice. That's really cool. I mean, and Jim's so talented, and he's such a nice guy. To have those words from him uh, also, you know, thanks, man. Thanks, brother. That's, <laughs> that's great stuff. And we just got one from a newly minted World Fantasy finalist, C.S.E. Cooney, where she says it reminds her of the heroic classics of the genre that she grew up with. And... A heady elixir of blood, battle, magic, triumph, and tenderness. I mean, brother, you are reigning in the kinds of reviews that, as our press and PR guy, I usually have to work my tail off for. What's that like? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Uh, it, feels, it feels pretty awesome. Like I said, I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. And we do happen to have one of your earliest print reviews with us here, and from the fine Iron Age folks at Animal Magazine. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it yet. Could you do me a favor and read that last line of the review? Read the last line of the review. Okay. So here's the premier issue of Anvil Magazine, which, by the way, looks and feels pretty darned awesome. Wow, what paper quality. Yeah. All right, so the last sentence. Uh, let's see. You mean this one, Sword and Sorcery, has its next great hero, and Hanabar is his name? That's the one. Yeah, that, that's, that's a pretty nice sentence. I mean, authors, readers, reviewers, we're all falling in love with Hanavar just as quick as you did. That's got to be a damned good feeling. It, it's, um, it doesn't quite feel real yet. So I'm just going to keep writing Hanavar and um, try not to worry about what anyone says and hope readers love it. And while we will be back next week, hoping to plumb Howard's mind of some of his sword and sorcery gems, before we go, for all the folks who might not have picked up Lord of a Shattered Land, and for all the folks I hope will do so to see that look on Howard's face again, what would you like to tell them? Oh my goodness. Uh... <laughs> what would I like to tell you? Go buy my book. Read it and love it. Tell everyone you know. Well, until next week, where we rejoin Howard Andrew Jones, this has been the Bane Free Radio Hour, and this is Sean C.W. Korsgaard, signing off. Until next time. And now we bring you our audiobook serialization of Tinker by Wynne Spencer. Inventor girl genius Tinker lives in a near-future Pittsburgh, which now exists mostly in the land of the elves. She runs her salvage business, pays her taxes, and tries to keep the local ambient level of magic down with gadgets of her own design. When a pack of wargs chase an elven noble into her scrapyard, life as she knows it takes a serious detour. Tinker finds herself taking on the elven court, the NSA, the elven interdimensional agency, technology smugglers, and a college-minded xenobiologist as she tries to stay focused on what's really important, her first date. Armed with an intelligence the size of a planet, steel-toed boots, and a junkyard dog attitude, Tinker is ready to kick butt to get her first kiss. Chapter 2 In the Eye of God Time seemed to crawl by, 
The cousins went outside and found it was dawn. Someone had pulled the flatbed out of the way and locked it up. The keys needed to be found. Once they managed to get into the truck, they discovered that they'd made the break across the border on fumes. Oil Can dug out a fuel can and went off in search of gasoline. Exhausted, Tinker bolted the trailer door, then stripped out of her day-old clothes and pulled on clean panties and her hoverbike team shirt. Curling up on her work table where Windwolf had recently lain, she tried to sleep. Her torn left hand hurt, but she was too tired to check under the bandages that Johnny had put on her. It wouldn't help to look anyhow. She'd killed all her first aid supplies dealing with Windwolf. Johnny had said that she would need to check into a hospital, she thought as she drifted off. When Oil Can came back, she'd have him drop her at mercy. A banging on the trailer door woke her. She felt cold and weak as she half fell off the work table. She put out her left hand to catch herself, and the pain made her cry out. She curled tight around her hand, cursing. Whoever was at the door stopped beating on it. The flatbed jostled oddly. Tinker squeaked in surprise as she suddenly found herself being hauled up and backward. Windwolf swung her up and sat her on the work table. Windwolf! She blinked at him, confused by his appearance, until she realized that he had opened the flatbed's cab door and crawled through the AC vent. What are you doing here? What is this for? He held up the spell she had abandoned in the trash. Tulu told me that's what I should cast when I paid the debt. Debt? You put a life debt on me, during a fight with Asaurus, five years ago? He cocked his head and looked at her for a long minute. You're the fearless little savage with the crooked metal bar? The one that put the Saurus's eye out while I was dazed? When had he been dazed? Um, yes. I had a tire iron. You were a boy. She shook her head. I've always been a girl. I was only thirteen. I was a child. He gave a cold, hard laugh. And you're not a child now? He crumpled up the circuit paper and flung it away. And who told you about this debt? Tulu. I showed her the spell you put on me and asked her what it was. She said if you died as your body rotted, so would mine. He went still. So that's the only reason you saved me? She waved his question away with her good hand. It just made things scarier, that's all. As if the foo dogs weren't enough to scare the shit out of me. I had this added little creepiness to deal with. I wouldn't have done anything different, but now we're even. We are not even. What? Look, I saved you. I risked my life, got my hand screwed up. She held up her hand to show the bound wound. I tore my place into pieces so I could crate you around. We drove all over Lane's flower beds and yard, making big ruts and killing the plants, and I told her I would go to college to make it up to her. I pulled a gun on the Border Patrol, who weren't even Border Patrol, but that's another story, all to save your life, and you would have been dead. If I hadn't helped you fight those foo dogs and then hauled your skinny elf ass out here to the rim, you would have died a couple times over. He pulled his knife, making her yelp and flinch back. He caught hold of her wounded hand, a glint of light from the silver blade, and he cut off the bandage. Don't argue with the elf. Yes, sir, no, sir. Then get the hell away from him. He gazed at her hand and then caught hold of her head, pulled her to him. His lips touched her forehead, where he had once painted the symbol. What the hell does that mean? Windwolf reached over and unlocked the trailer door. He picked her up then, like she was a child. Tinker squirmed in his hold. What the hell do you think you're doing? Put me down. No. He carried her out of the trailer and across the street. Various elves scurried toward them, bowing and speaking quickly in high elvish. Windwolf gave Kirk commands that were instantly obeyed with a fluid bow and... Sha, Zedomu. Windwolf carried her into the hospice through a maze of hallways. A storm of high elvish continued all around her, all too fast for her to understand. Please speak slower, please. She hated high elvish because it was so extremely polite. Yet no matter how many times she asked, no one seemed to take notice of her. 
Windwolf stopped finally in a small room, typical of the hospice. The floor was a dark, warm blue color, the walls the color of honey, and the lighting came from the soft glow of the ceiling. Windwolf laid her on a high bed. Its pale birch headboard was more ornate than any human-style hospital bed, but otherwise it seemed to serve the same purpose. Tinker sat up, swearing in a mix of low Elvish and English. Answer me, damn it. What do you think you are doing? A silver-haired female elf took a clear jar down from a birch cabinet. She handed it to Windwolf. He carried it back across the room, unscrewing the wide lid. Inside was a large golden flower. What's that for? Tinker didn't bother with Elvish this time. Putting the jar on the table beside the bed, Windwolf lifted the flower out and held it so close in front of Tinker's face that she nearly went cross-eyed looking at it. Smell it, Windwolf commanded. Tinker sniffed it cautiously. It reminded her of honeysuckle, a warm, drowsy smell with a soft drone of bees, the sway of green boughs, summer wind, blue skies, white clouds blistering white, softness piled and billowed upwards, Wispy here, knife-edged, sharp. Tinker realized that she was going under and jerked back. She tried to push the flower away with her wounded hand, too sleepy to remember it was hurt, and whimpered at the sudden flare of pain. Windwolf caught the back of her head, holding her still, pressing the flower to her nose. Just breathe it. Tinker fought instead, not sure what was happening, only determined not to be helpless before him. She punched him as he bruised the sweet silken petals against her. She had aimed for his groin, but he turned and she caught him in the hip. Do not fight, little savage. He caught her chin between thumb and pinky, holding her face as if in a vice, the flower cradled by his other fingers. He let go of her head and caught her wrists, forcing her back, pinning her down. You are only going to hurt yourself. She held her breath and squirmed under him, trying to kick him. He had his weight against her thighs and hips. Then she couldn't hold her breath any longer and gasped. Sweetness, warm and sleepy as clean sheets on a feather-soft bed full in the early morning sun. White light through sheer curtains, open window to wind from a garden. The female elf came across the room, laughing musically as only elves could, a silver knife in hand. The air went shimmering white, closing in around them, warm and liquid as honey and sweet. That was another installment in Wynn Spencer's Tinker, and that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to Audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judgowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to Howard Andrew Jones for sitting down with us today, and be sure to listen to part two next week. And good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars.